Okay. This is, if you were going to pick out for yourself the section of Genesis which you think would probably be least relevant for your life, this is probably the section. Right? We begin in Genesis 22, beginning in verse 20. After these things, it was told to Abraham, and he hears about his brother's sons. And then we pick up in 23, and it says in Genesis 23, verse 1, Sarah lived 127 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah, and she died. And then there's this whole chapter spent about this bartering back and forth about a field with which to bury Sarah. And at the end, it says, verse 20, the field and the cave that is in it were made over to Abraham as property for a burying place by the Hittites. And you just think, like, this is very irrelevant to me today. What would I possibly learn from this? Um, I'll say this. I don't find any other places in Genesis where this is done. We know lots of people were, died, right? We've got genealogies where people died. We've got stories where people died. And we don't have stories about their burial places. And so that would, I just, I just would say, would be the first clue that maybe something else is going on here. Maybe we should be listening for something more than just the details of how this place came to, to come into Abraham's possession. Maybe there's some lesson for us to be learned, or for us to learn, rather. A lesson to be learned and um, I hope I can demonstrate that today and as we go through here and that this text will become for you very relevant and that it becomes vital for understanding Abraham and what God was doing through him and in his life and setting us up for the story to follow and and teaches us in fact a lot about faith actually um, as we work through it that's my goal and my aim that you would profit from this text and um, the good news is I don't think it's a stretch to get there, right? I think it's, it's right there for us if we just pay attention to some of these details. And this is what we'll do then. Um, I plan to cover from chapter two, or sorry, chapter 22, verse 20, all the way through the end of 23 today. Uh, that may sound daunting, but uh, the feeling is I could go deeper with some of the details that I don't think really will profit us. They'll just take a lot of extra time. Um, so maybe if you have a lot of questions about how some of the certain things interrelate or maybe you have questions that arise as a result of going through here that I don't address, you can look it up and find out those answers for yourself or you can talk to me about it later and we can discuss those things. But I'm going to try to give us the main flow and, and really what's, been hap what's happening here and draw some lessons for us. So that's my intention. Um, I think it's very doable to get through all this considering the content. So why don't we pray, and then we will read this text and begin to make our way through it after that. Stan, would you pray? Okay, Genesis 22, verse 20. Now, after these things, before I read further, I just want to remind us what are these things. These things 
are what we would probably call the climax of Abraham's story in his life, and that is the sacrifice of Isaac, or the almost sacrifice of Isaac, thankfully, right? It was this intense test that God put him in, like you might say a test, like an experiment. He put Abraham into this situation to see what would Abraham do? What was Abraham made of? Did he fear God? And did he have faith in God? And he did, and that was evident, shown to us by, the, by his works, by what he did. And it, it, is, it is then, in response to that, then God, through an angel, spoke to Abraham and made him certain promises, a sworn oath that he would have a descendant who would possess the gates of his enemies and through whom all the nations would be blessed. Now then, after these things, it was told to Abraham, Behold, Milcah also has borne children to your brother Nahor, Uz his firstborn, Buz his brother, Kemuel the father of Aram, Chesed, Hazo, Pildash, Jidlap, and Bethuel, parentheses in my Bible. Bethuel fathered Rebekah, just telling us that. These eight Milcah bore to Nahor, Abraham's brother. Moreover, his concubine, whose name was Ruma bore Teba, Gaham, Tahash, and Makah. And you think, okay, we'll keep going. Sarah lived 127 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah. And Sarah died at Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went in to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. And Abraham rose up from before his dead and said to the Hittites, I am a sojourner and a foreigner among you. Give me property among you for a burying place that I may bury my dead out of my sight. The Hittites answered Abraham, Hear us, my Lord, you are a prince of God among us. Bury your dead in the choicest of our tombs None of us will withhold from you his tomb to hinder you from burying your dead. Abraham rose and bowed to the Hittites, the people of the land. And he said to them, If you are willing that I should bury my dead out of my sight, hear me and entreat for me Ephron the son of Zohar, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he owns. It is at the end of his field. For the full price, let him give it to me in your presence as property for a burying place. Now Ephron was sitting among the Hittites, and Ephron the Hittite answered Abraham in the hearing of the Hittites, of all who went in at the gate of his city. No, my Lord, hear me. I give you the field, and I give you the cave that is in it. In the sight of the sons of my people, I give it to you. Bury your dead. Then Abraham bowed down, you could say again, before the people of the land. And he said to Ephron in the hearing of the people of the land, But if you will hear me, I give the price of the field. Accept it from me, that I may bury my dead there. And Ephron answered Abraham, My Lord, listen to me. A piece of land worth 400 shekels of silver, what is that between you and me? Bury your dead. And Abraham listened to Ephron. And Abraham weighed out for Ephron the silver that he had named in the hearing of the Hittites, 400 shekels of silver, according to the weights current among the merchants. So the field of Ephron and Machpelah, which was to the east of Mamre, the field with the cave that was in it, and all the trees that were in the field throughout its whole area, was made over to Abraham as a possession in the presence of the Hittites before all who went in at the gate of his city. After this, Abraham buried Sarah his wife in the cave of the field of Machpelah east of Mamre, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. The field and the cave that is in it were made over to Abraham as property for a burying place by the Hittites. Okay. Now, as we begin to 
work through this. Let me provide you with a general outline of the material, which I hope as you hear it will cause you to begin to think of this text along the lines I want you to. Hopefully, you've, as I read it, you already began to think that way. Uh, first, in Genesis 22, 20 through 24, uh, we learn, along with Abraham, that his brother, who was left in Paddan Aram, or left in Haran, has had 12 sons, eight by his wife and four more by a concubine. Next, so there's that material. We'll, look about the, we'll learn about the purpose of that momentarily. Next, we read about Sarah's death and burial. That's kind of all of chapter 23. It's not really though so much about her death and her burial as it is about obtaining a place for this burial. If you look with me, verses 1 and 2, you have the report that Sarah died. Really, verses 1 and the first half of 2. Sarah lived 127 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah. And Sarah died at Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And then it goes on to talk about what Abraham did. So she died. you got a verse and a half about that. And then down to verse 19. One more verse. After this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field of Machpelah, east of Mamre, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And those verses repeat almost the, a lot of the same words even, right? So it's, it's, it starts with that and ends with that. But if you turn, look at verse count, I mean, it's almost all entirely about this negotiation that happens between Abraham and the people of the Hittites, the people of the land, as they're called. So it's really... The, the interest for us lies in the details of that. There's something about that that we should learn from. And I submit it's not about uh, negotiating tactics, right? It's not, that's not the idea. Um, so this is what we, what we see. Um, what we see is Abraham is seeking not just a place to bury her, but a new, and I'll, this is what I mean, a new ancestral burial ground. He wants a new ancestral burial ground for his family in the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites rather than burying her body in what was undoubtedly the ancestral home of his family in Haran or perhaps even Ur of the Chaldeans. So what do we have here in chapter 23? Just to outline it. First of all, in verses 1 and 2, we have the report of Sarah's death and Abraham's mourning. We already read about his, her death. The second half of verse 2 says, And Abraham went in to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. That's reported to us. What happens? Then, then we can move on. And the rest of the chapter is about Abraham secures the field and the cave of Machpelah for a possession to bury his dead. This is um, verse 3 all the way down to verse 18. And we could look at that in three kind of sections. First of all, you know, Abraham makes a request and they respond. Then he makes another request, they respond, and another request, and they respond. So this happens three times. The, the first time, Abraham seeks for a possession of land for a burial place. But they respond, rather, he, he gets from them permission from the Hittites who owned all the land to bury his dead in any of their tombs however great or grand those tombs might be. None of them would withhold from him or keep him from using one of their tombs. He says, give me land for a possession, and they say, you can use any of our tombs if you want. Second time, Abraham again seeks for a possession of land for a burial place, but rather secured permission from Ephron to use his field and cave however he needed for a burial location to bury Sarah. Whatever you need to do to the field or the cave, all that, you can do what you need to. I, I'm going to give it to you. You can use it. It's fine. You can have it. This won't work. Third time, Abraham again seeks for a possession of land for a burial place, and finally this time secures it by legally acquiring the field and the cave of Machpelah for 400 shekels of silver. It's kind of the order in which this happens. So then, now that he's got possession, next section, Abraham buried Sarah in the cave of Machpelah, which was his newly acquired possession, verses 19 and 20. With that outline then in front of us, I hope, let's just begin to work through the text, seek to learn and apply what we can. 
So Genesis 22, verses 20 through 24. Here Abraham learns that his brother Nahor has had children. Now you might remember that Abraham had two brothers. If you remember his story, he was one of three brothers from his father, Tehran. One of his brothers was named Haran, the father of Lot. Now Haran, back in Genesis uh, 11 and 12, we learn Haran died in Ur of the Chaldeans, and he never left Ur of the Chaldeans. And um, that was the land of his kindred, it says. He died in the land of his kindred in Ur of the Chaldeans. Then the family then left and journeyed on to Padan Aram, or to Haran, a place called Haran, likely a family name. And there they settled before Abraham, after his father died, continued on into the land of Canaan, taking his wife and Lot with him. But his other brother, Nahor, had, who had evidently had not had children by the time Abraham left. And Nahor stayed in Haran, stayed in Padan Aram. Somehow, we don't know how exactly, but after these things, it was told. We're not, we don't know who told Abraham, but it was told to Abraham. He received word that his brother had had these children. It's not hard to imagine a traveler, perhaps some merchant maybe coming through, maybe from Babylon, all, Ur of the Chaldeans on up through Padanaram, spend some time there, meet some people. Maybe he's from there. He's selling his wares down in Egypt, perhaps, and he's passing through. And, and Abraham, we know he's known now for his hospitality, and he entertains this man, perhaps. And as they begin talking about his travels, he realizes he spent some time in Haran. And he says, do you happen to... Have you heard anything about Nahor? No, who's Nahor? Oh, Nahor. Oh, that Nahor? I know that Nahor. Let me tell you all about him. And he gets word about his, he's got these children. However it happened, it's not hard to imagine a scenario in which Abraham might have heard about his brother Nahor. Somehow this man and, and he know some of the same people and he discovers news about his brother. I will say this, though, we have no reason to suspect that news traveled both ways, that Abraham sent a report back, because later on we read in Genesis, it appears that they didn't, Abraham's family, his brother's family, didn't really know anything about Abraham. So this guy is probably just passing through, and, and that's that. He doesn't return to give any news to Nahor. So what is the purpose of this? Why tell us that Abraham received word about his brother's Sons, like, I mean, that this changed your life now that you know that, right? I mean, what is, why give us this information? Why does Moses want me to know this? And why does he, I mean, why, why should I care? Why should the people of Israel care? The answer to this question, I think, is rather simple. Until now, you remember Genesis is broken up in these told dot sections. These are the generations of, and it goes for a while and tells us some it's all kind of a unit, and then it moves on to someone else. This is in the, soul, the section, the Toldot section of Terah, Abraham's father. Until now, this whole section has been about the new phase and redemptive history that began with Terah's son, Abram, now called Abraham. And to Abraham, God had made promises that would result in the blessing of God coming once again to mankind and eventually to the world. Every family on the earth will receive this blessing of life with God through justification, through forgiveness of sins, and this unfettered experience of God's love that follows from being completely forgiven of your sins by God. However, in order to bring this about in the way that God has planned, God has to first begin to change Abraham or Abram from the sort of man that he is when we read from Joshua, he was a pagan serving false gods. God's got to change him from that into the sort of man who has a mature trust and confidence in God. He's got to do something in Abraham's life. And to whom God's character would be understood and feared and revered. Now, all of Abraham's life until now, we could say, can be understood in that way. Leading up to one momentous test of his fear of and his faith in God. The testing of Abraham. And the test that God chose was the command to sacrifice Isaac to God, Abraham's only son, whom he loved deeply. Now, this was a severe test, as it would be to any of us, but it was even more so to Abraham, because not only was Abraham being asked to do the unthinkable, but he also had received from God specific promises 
concerning Isaac's future. Well, Abraham obeyed God, and he set out on a journey to, with his son and with some servants to offer his son as a sacrifice on the mountain that God would show him. He went out on his way, and God said, I'll show you what specific mountain when you get there. Along the way, we, be, we learn that Abraham began to think this over in his mind. He began to resolve this tension between God made these promises about what he would certainly do through Isaac, and he's commanding me now to offer him in worship as a sacrifice. And he began to reason, how could this be? What would God do to make this work? And there were two possible outcomes that he came to. And we read these in the text, of course. One, either God would stop him and provide a substitute offering, or God would raise Isaac up from the dead after the sacrifice. But one way or another, he was going to obey God, and God would make, through, make good on his promises. So he had this faith in God, and he had a fear of God. Both things were evident. Now Abraham was convinced that God would do these things because he believed God concerning the promises that he made about Isaac. God was trustworthy. He learned that. He knew that. But he also had to go through with the sacrifice and the thing that God commanded him because he feared God as his God. Right? He had to serve him as his God. Now this test revealed things about Abraham's character. And we can see that he has truly grown in faith and grown in his fear of God. Every other time God ever commanded him to do something he didn't want to do, he told God no, or he argued with God and tried to convince God to do something different. This time he just, yes, Lord. It was the, 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 most hard, the hardest thing he was ever commanded to do by God. He had grown to the point where he didn't object at all, and he just said, yes, sir, and he went to, to obey. This was a remarkable change in Abraham. He was now the sort of man God was molding him to be. This is the climax of Abraham's story, the high point in his part in Genesis. And now, that having been accomplished, remember, Abraham had to be a certain kind of man if his descendants were going to learn from him. He's God now tested him, and he's proven to be that kind of man. And so the story begins to transition away from Abraham very quickly and move into looking at Isaac. And this marks, this text in Genesis 22, marks the beginning of that transition. We're given a big clue about Moses' purpose in reporting Abraham's discovery about his, his brother's uh, children by this name drop that happens. So he says, if you look at the text, now after these things it was told to Abraham. So Abraham passed the test. So what, is, what news does he get? Well, he gets news about his, his brother's descendants. He's got children. But look at verse 22. Chesed, Hazo, Pildash, Jidlap, and Bethuel. Bethuel fathered Rebekah. Now we haven't read anything about Rebekah yet in Genesis. But the people of Israel, and you as a someone who's grown up around the Bible or have heard Bible stories in the past probably know Rebekah is Isaac's wife. Isaac, who doesn't have a wife yet, it's going to be his wife. He just drops that name in here. Bethuel fathered Rebekah. So this is who we're talking about. So he wants you to know that. The point is this. Sometime after Abraham had gone through the test of God, he learns that his family in Haran had children. His brother had children. If he were back in Haran, imagine he were back in Haran, who would he likely choose for his son to marry? One of these descendants from his brother. Now that sounds a little odd to us, but that was common practice back then. And it was, in fact, what, his, what Nahor had done. Nahor had married. Milcah was his niece, right? We read that in Genesis 11. So this is likely who he would choose to have her have his son marry from these descendants. One of these boys would have a daughter, and his son would marry them. And that's, in fact, what did happen. And we're even given that clue here by Moses, Bethuel fathered Rebekah. And you think, oh, okay, this is, that's, that's Isaac's father-in-law. So this is who he likely would have chosen. He would look for a daughter for his son from these people. But, of course, he is in Canaan. He's in Canaan. 
Moses assumes we know a bit about who Isaac eventually marries, and since he wants us to make this connection right now, not later in the story, he wants you to make the connection now, that Abraham is beginning to think, to have reasons to go back to Haran, to go back to Padan Aram, to leave Canaan in the interest of the well-being of his son, in the interest of what every natural father would do in that time, would go seek a, a, a bride for your son from among your family and your kindred, he has reasons to go. And then his, so there's that. This is the big reason to think about returning. Moses' point is to build this tension. Abraham is now in Canaan, and he's starting to have reasons to think to leave and go elsewhere. And it's also to get us thinking more about Isaac and what's going to come in the future of this fulfill of this promise being fulfilled and the future of those who receive the promise not so much about Abraham but get us thinking a little bit more about what this means for Isaac we are to be thinking about the future after Abraham at this point not merely the events of his life as they transpire Abraham had revealed in his testing that he was full of faith in the future that God had promised now his attention Abraham's attention is turning more squarely to preparing for that future I believe God will do it. Now I need to prepare for it. I've got news about family and where they're, that they have descendants and there's maybe a, a bride to be out there. I need to be thinking about this. The first thing that comes up for Abraham is this news about his brother's descendants. One more question about this section before we move on. Why is it here? Notice, this is, he gives us this news now about, you know, Bethel, Bethel fathered Rebekah and about these descendants. Then it, right after, it gives us that news. Let's skip chapter 23, look at the beginning of 24. Now Abraham was old, well advanced in years, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had charge of all that he had, put your hand under my thigh, that I may make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell, but will go to my country and to my kindred and take a wife for my son Isaac. That seems to fit. Why this? Why not take Genesis 22, the end of 22, and put it at the beginning of 24? That fits a lot better. Like, why include it ahead of time? It just doesn't make. It doesn't seem to make sense. Well, here's why. First of all, we don't know for sure, but we, I think it's probable that this puts it in, having it reported this way puts it in chronological order. It's probably the order in which it happened. Probably heard this in news first. And I say that because, I, because of the next reason I give, and I think if it didn't happen this way in history, chronologically, in this order, I think Moses is kind of playing fast and loose with us. So the second reason is this. I think it's a subtle way of demonstrating and showing the changing focus of Abraham, and it gives us a context in which to think about his actions in chapter 23. I think both of these things are true. Namely this. He has one huge reason to take up and leave and go back to his homeland because he needs a, a, a bride for his son. And now he has another reason to leave. His wife has died. And he wants to honor her and bear, give her a proper burial like she deserves, which would be in an ancestral home. He's got every reason to leave, but he doesn't. He stays. And I think that's a, a part of what the tension that this builds. It get, as you're reading this, you're thinking, he needs to, get, he needs to leave and get, a, get his son married, and now he's got another reason to leave. What's he doing here? So it create, helps create some more tension for us about why Abraham would stay and why he would enter into all these negotiations and try to overcome all these difficulties, which maybe you don't realize are difficulties yet. But. So let's move on then into Genesis chapter 23. These first two verses can look at the report of Sarah's death and Abraham's mourning. It says, Sarah lived 107 and 27 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah. Now, just for reference, let me tell you then, at this time, Abraham then is 137, and their son Isaac, who is just two chapters old, is 37. 
So he's 37. We, all we know about him so far is that he, you know, he nursed at his, at his, at his, uh, with his mother for a few years. Then he was made fun of and ridiculed and picked on and abused by his older brother Ishmael, who was sent out. And then sometime during his middle childhood, his early teen years or late preteens, he was off, potentially offered up as a sacrifice, which didn't happen. He was, he was spared. And then now he's 37 years old. Bachelor, right? So this is all we know about it. But that's, we do know that. And we know that Abraham is thinking about his son. Um, so probably 20 to 25 years have passed since the testing of Abraham about Isaac. We could say for sure in that range, 20 to 25 years. Notice this language here. Sarah died at Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. I mean, they could have just said at Hebron. I mean, we know this already by all the references we've been reading in these other chapters. We know where this is. Why does Moses go out of his way to say at Kiriath Arba, which is a foreign name, and he says that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. He's being very specific about where this is, reminding us specifically, physically, where they are in this land of Canaan. That's important. Why make such a big deal about the place where she died? I'll say again, because in that culture, you are buried in your ancestral home, if at all possible, to be buried with your fathers, to be buried with your people, to be gathered together with your people is a big deal. And you, not everyone, that doesn't happen for everyone. A lot of people die and they're just buried out or wherever they die or you know, in the land where they are. And you might say, well, that's probably what's going to happen here. That's what the Hittites seem to be willing to let Abraham do. But Abraham's not willing to do that. Now look at the rest of verse 2. And Abraham went in to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. He went in. Likely, uh, actually, let me, let me stop for a moment. I, I don't want to miss this. I want this to land on you. Um, again, many times people weren't buried in their ancestral homes. But it was a really big thing. Burial was one thing. You wanted to bury your dead. That was significant. That's a way to honor them. But burial, burial in your ancestral home was another thing entirely. I want to have you turn to one other passage in Genesis to see how important this can be and what an honor this can be. So turn with me to, the, to Genesis chapter 49. Genesis chapter 49. beginning in verse 28. And we will read to the end of Genesis here. Genesis 49. All these are the 12 tribes of Israel. This is what their father said to them as he blessed them. This is Jacob now. Blessing each with the blessing suitable to him. And that, that just passed. We're not reading that section. Then he commanded them and said to them, I am to be gathered to my people. Bury with me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite. That's this field that we're talking about, that we just read about. In the cave that is in the field at Machpelah, to the east of Mamre, in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with the field from Ephron the Hittite to possess as a burying place. There they buried Abraham and Sarah his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah his wife. And there I buried Leah. The field and the cave that is in it were bought from the Hittites. When Jacob finished commanding his sons, he drew up his feet into the bed and breathed his last and was gathered to his people. Now listen to what happens now. Then Joseph, who remember was in charge pretty much in, in Egypt, fell on his father's face and wept over him and kissed him. And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. So the physicians embalmed Israel. Forty days were required for it. For that is how many are required for embalming. And the Egyptians wept for him 70 days. And when the days of weeping for him were past, Joseph spoke to the household of Pharaoh, saying, If now I have found favor in your eyes, please speak in the ears of Pharaoh, saying, My father made me swear, saying, I am about to die in my tomb that I have hewed out for myself in the land of Canaan. There shall, there shall you bury me. Now therefore let me please go up and bury my father. Then I will return. And Pharaoh answered, Go up. And bury your father as he made you swear. So Joseph went up to bury his father. Listen to this, the, the, the honor that's given here. 
With him went up all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his household, and all the elders of the land of Egypt, as well as all the household of Joseph, his brothers, and his father's household. Only their children, their flocks, and their herds were left in the land of Goshen. And there went up with him both chariots and horsemen. It was a very great company. When they came to the threshing floor of Atad, which is beyond the Jordan, they lamented there with a very great and grievous lamentation. And he made a mourning for his father seven days. And when the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the mourning on the threshing floor of Atad, they said, This is a grievous, a, a grievous mourning by the Egyptians. Therefore the place was called Abel Mizraim. It is beyond the Jordan. Thus his sons did for him as he had commanded them. For his sons carried him to the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave of the field at Machpelah to the east of Mamre, which Abraham bought with the field from Ephron the Hittite to possess as a burying place. After he had buried his father, Joseph returned to Egypt with his brothers and all who had gone up with him to bury his father. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, It may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, Your father gave this command before he died. So they lied to him. Say to Joseph, Please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for, I, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear, I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. So Joseph remained in Egypt, he and his father's house. Joseph lived 110 years, and Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation. The children also of Machir, the son of Manasseh, were counted as Joseph's own. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will visit you and bring you up out of this land to the land that he swore to Abram, Abraham to Isaac and to Jacob. And then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. So Joseph died, being 110 years old. They embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. Now, I won't read the other, the other places I could read where he is then carried in and then buried in that same cave. This is a big deal. They made a big deal of it. That's a lot to read, but I, I just wanted you to see what to what great lengths this mattered to them and how far they would go to make sure that they honored those they revered in this way. And if there's anything we see about Abraham and his mourning for Sarah, it's, it's first of all, sometimes in the biblical text it says, and they mourned for so-and-so and, and then they buried them. Sometimes it just says they mourned for them. Sometimes, not always, it says they mourned and they wept. And usually when that's used, it's kind of to highlight what a big deal this is for those who are experiencing the grief. And this is what it says about Abraham. He mourned for Sarah. He went in to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. He may have gone into her tent to do this or possibly his own. I'm not exactly sure. I think it's more likely her tent that he goes into. But nonetheless, he mourns and he weeps. And he wanted to honor her in death. He was determined to do so. The most natural way to do that would be to take her body to be buried back in his ancestral home back in Haran, where his father had died and where his family had settled all this time. But if he did that, he would be looking back upon that land and that place as where he rightly belonged. This is our home in Haran. This is where we belong. This is where our descendants will come to visit and to pay homage and to remember us. And that would be to forget all that God had promised him here in Canaan. So he can't go back. He would be directing, that would be an act that would direct Isaac and all of his later descendants to think of Haran as their home. When in fact their future lies in the land of Canaan according to God's promise. So he doesn't act that way. And this is the tension that we should feel as we realize how much Abraham is mourning for Sarah when we see him seeking a place to bury her in the land of Canaan and resisting every urge to go back to Haran. He's got a son who needs a bride. He's got a wife who needs a burial. He could go out there and, they would, and he would have an ancestral home if he just made the journey. 
he could bury her there. They would welcome him to do that. Everyone would feel like it was the right thing, except for Abraham, and probably except for Sarah, because she's she dies in faith, according to Hebrews. But there's this, there's another tension in the text as well. If we just imagine ourselves in Abraham's, I guess, sandals for a moment. He was given these promises from God, and Sarah was included in that. Now, think of this, with no land to show for it, he's 137 years old, with no worldwide blessing that's come yet, and with no child but one, Sarah's dead. Like all the times before, God could say, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do all these things for you. And they could just look forward. And then he was told, it's going to be you and Sarah, and you're going to have a son. And this is what I'm going to do through you. And now Sarah's dead. And a lot of these things haven't happened yet. Think of that for a moment. She died in faith, not having obtained the promise. Until now, Abraham's never seen that happen. They've always, they've been alive, waiting for God to, what more will God do for us? What more will we see with our own eyes? Sarah will see no more. Sarah never, she's not going to see any grandchildren. <coughs> she's not going to see any of this pass on. She's not going to know what happens. She's dead. She didn't even have a place to be buried. Right? This is a huge deal. So, Sarah dies having not received the promises. Abraham's likely to be next, and the promises are still un largely unfulfilled, and they will remain that way during his lifetime. Think of this, though. He's not living out the rest of his days seeking for God to make good on all the things God has promised him. But rather, he has an understanding now that God will continue to be in the process of bringing his word about for more than the rest of Abraham's days. He's been told by God, sworn with an oath, that some 400 years are going to pass before his descendants come back to the land and have it as a possession. And he's been told that it's not through him, but through some descendant of his, specifically, that this blessing's going to come. So in Abraham's mind, like, the, most of what God has promised him, the great things God has promised him, are going to come at least 400 years away. That doesn't mean God's unfaithful. It just means he's going to live out his days and he can know for certain that most of the good things God has promised to bring about, to bring to the world, he's not going to see in his time, though God will continue to be faithful to him as an individual. Like God is, he's still God's man. But he's not going to see a lot of these things. So how is Abraham going to respond then to Sarah's death? How does the man of faith handle this situation and where will he bury her? And we go on then from, from here. The rest of the, the majority of the text here, verses 3 to 18. Let's look at verses 3 through 6. And again, this is Abraham is seeking for a possession of land for a burial place, but rather they give him permission to bury his dead even in the best of their tombs. Let's look at that. Verse 3, And Abraham rose up from before his dead, Right, he had gone in, he was mourning and weeping, kind of he's done with that for a moment. He's, he rises up and he goes to the Hittites and he, and he says to them, I am a sojourner and foreigner among you. He acknowledges that. The, it all, belong, all this place belongs to them. But he acknowledges, look, I'm, I'm a sojourner, I'm a traveler, and I'm a foreigner. I'm not among you. I'm not one of your people. Yet, what does he say? Give me property among you for a burying place, that I may bury my dead out of my sight. Now this is something that was not even legal in Israel. When Israel had possession of the land, you couldn't sell it permanently to a foreigner. And this is the way land works in the ancient times. Like if your people own the land and dwell there, you don't sell it to foreigners. You just don't do that. So this was not being done. This was unlikely. It's a big obstacle. He's a foreigner and a sojourner among the Hittites. What does he ask? He stood before them, I am a sojourner and a foreigner among you. Give me property among you for a burying place that I might bury my dead out of my sight. 
Verse 5, the Hittites answered Abraham, Hear us, my Lord. You are a prince of God among us. Bury your dead in the choicest of our tombs. None of us will withhold from you his tomb to hinder you from burying your dead. So there's this huge obstacle in his way. And they respond. How? How do they respond? They, op they say, look, you can... They're, they don't even entertain the idea of selling him land. They don't even, they're like, you're not getting the land. But first of all, they compliment him. They say he's a prince of God among them, which could mean prince of God or could mean a mighty prince. And I don't really care which way you take it. Either way, to me, it demonstrates the fulfillment of part of what God had promised him, that he would have a great name among the people. And he's got that. They, they respect him and revere him. They see him as a mighty man, a worthy man, that none of them... It, like, so they've, you've carved out a tomb for your family, and it's your ancestral home, and you would be honored if Abraham would be buried there. N pick any of them. Like, we would be happy for you. We, none of us would ever think about withholding from you our own family tomb. Like, we would be happy for you to be buried there. But it's our, it's our tomb. Like, it's not, you're not going to get the property. We're happy to let you do this. You don't need to... But also, it might be a way of assuring him look, we, we like you. You don't need to buy the land just to bury your dead. You can bury her in any of these places. You don't need to buy the land. Because they're thinking he's not going to travel to his ancestral home. There's some reason he's not going to make that journey. He's here and he, just, he needs to just bury her. Here, you can bury her here. You can bury her there. None of us will withhold this from you. We'd be happy to let you do that. But Abraham has in mind, he wants this possession. He wants a new ancestral home. Because whether they know it or not, and I, very likely he's not told any of them, God has promised him that his descendants will have all this land, and this will be their new home. The Hittites just don't know it yet. So here they are. He's seeking a possession. He wants property rights for the purpose of a burial place for Sarah. Until now, Abraham did not have even a foot's length of land that was his own. We read that in the New Testament. Not even a foot's length. He didn't, there was nowhere he could stand that he could say, well, at least this is mine. None of it was his, right? He was traveling from place to place, living in tents, grazing off the land, living by the good graces of the people who were around. He made a well. He got some water. People were arguing over, that's not yours, that's ours, right? He's like, well, I, I dug it. Well, okay, you can use it. And that's it. You know, and he's trying to make treaties, and they're just kind of, they're going to let him be out there in the countryside, but if, if times get hard, they're going to go take those springs back from him, those wells, and take them because they need them. They're not going to just let him have them. So this is his life, and now he wants a burial place. Good luck, man. They think highly of him, but they are not entertaining the idea of selling him the land as a possession. They praise him as a prince of God, but they're not going to offer him the land. They offer him again instead to use the best of their tombs. Some reasons this will not work for Abraham. First, he wants to honor her in a family burial place, not a borrowed tomb. Right? We remember what a, what a, what a uh, disgrace that was even for the Lord in a sense. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. We don't want this. He doesn't want this for her. He loves her. He wants to honor her and find a, a, a worthy place for Sarah, the mother of the faithful. Second, their, imagine their pagan practices certainly would be reflected in their burial tombs. You can imagine that. Like what kind of pictures are painted on the wall? What kind of carvings and engravings are in these tombs, so-called? This isn't good. He doesn't want her there. You remember there were places, times where he would go up and go up to a high place where they would have an altar and he would erect another altar for God. He knew this wasn't, this isn't an altar to God. I'll make an altar to God. And so this tomb would not work. He did not want to use their tombs, however elegant and decorative and beautifully crafted they might be. He was seeking property for a burial site for his family from now and into the future. Again, he would have no reason to think that they would sell him the land being a foreigner. Well then, so he, he comes back again. Verse 7. So how does he respond? Abraham rose and bowed to the Hittites. He bowed, sign of reverence, respect, acknowledging a weaker position. 
right? It's like maybe you didn't, maybe you didn't hear me, right? He had bowed to the tides, the people of the land. They're the ones who own the land. He says, what does he say to him? If you are willing that I should bury my dead out of my sight, hear me. So you've told me, you pick a tomb, you can have it. He says, okay, if you're willing and you seem to be favorably disposed to me to give me what you're saying, I'm asking you this. Entreat for me Ephron, the son of Zohar, that he may give me. So you guys want to give me something. Then give me this. What I want, what I'm after, is the cave of Machpelah, which he owns. It is at the end of his field. For the full price, let him give it to me in your presence as a property, as property for a burying place. You're willing to give me something. Give me this. And I will pay the full price for it because I want it as property for a burying place. I just don't want a hole to put her in. I want to have property here. I want to have rights to it. Right? You see that. That's clear. It comes out again. I want it as, prop, as property for a burying place. He wants to turn it legally into a cemetery of some sort. This will be the place, legally, owned by Abraham. So, what do we see? Let's look at verse 10. Now Ephron was sitting among the Hittites. So it's, it's his land. He's, he's a, now Abraham has asked the Hittites in a, as a group to entreat Ephron. Maybe he knows Ephron's there. Maybe he's not, he didn't see him in the, among the group. But whatever. He says, you guys, look, if you are all willing to do this, I'm asking you to go to Ephron and seek to get this for me. And I'll pay for it. And then, well, Ephron's there. And Ephron says to him, Ephron the Hittite answered Abraham in the hearing of all the Hittites. He didn't say, hey, come over here, let's negotiate. He said, I'll answer you in front of everyone in the gate of the city. Here we are. This is where legal transactions are made. He says, no, my Lord, verse 11, no, my Lord, hear me. Abraham, I, I hear what you're saying, but listen, I give you the field. I give you the cave that is in it. and the sight of the sons of my people, I give it to you, bury your dead, which I don't think it might be. There are people who differ on this, but I don't think he's offering to give it to him as a possession because he doesn't say, I give it to you as, a, as property. He's saying, listen, use it how you want. You don't need to buy it. It's again, you don't have to buy it and I'm not really wanting to sell it. So here you go. You can use it, not only the cave, but the field you mentioned. I mean, whatever you, however you want to use it, you can use it to bury her. But he doesn't offer to sell it to him or to give it to him as property. So he's still without. So you've got people who are saying, we'll let you do whatever you want. And they're just kind of not willing to do what you really do want them to do. This is an obstacle. They don't tend to sell land like this. This is a problem. Bury your dead. So the third round. And he said to Ephron in the hearing of the people of the land, but if you will hear me. So they're kind of saying, no, no, listen to me. Listen to what I'm saying. He said, no, 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 you hear me. Well, no, you hear me. Listen to me, please, right? He said to Ephron in the hearing of the people of the land, but if you will, hear me. I give the price of the field. Accept it from me that I may bury my dead there. So he's saying, look, I know I, I need to purchase it. I can't just use it. I want to buy it. Ephron answered Abraham, my Lord, listen to me. A piece of land worth 400 shekels of silver. What is that between you and me? Bury your dead. Then it says, Abram listened to Ephron. Now, so here's what Ephron was doing. When, Ephron, when he says, a piece of land worth 400 shekels of silver, what is that between you and me? He's saying, this is really expensive. Like my selling price is 400 shekels of silver. Very, very costly. Just use it. You can't afford it. Just use it, right? It's, this is 400 shekels of silver. Now to give you an idea, and we won't turn there just for the sake of time, but you could turn to 2 Samuel 24, 24 and find that David, when he purchased the site, which would be the Temple Mount, he paid one-eighth of this price, right? One-eighth of this price. This is likely, it depends on who you look at, I tend to go with the higher measurement, but at least 10, but it's probably more like 100 pounds of silver for this land, and it's like a small field where there's a cave there, and it's like, this is a lot. So, and I think Ephron probably sets his price high 
so that Abraham has to kind of negotiate, because you're not going to be taken. Like, so you've got to negotiate, and if he negotiates, then Ephron can not sell it and just say, if it's too rich, that's fine, just use it. So he doesn't have to sell it. He can just force Abram just to use it. He doesn't want to sell it. And this is like, I mean, this is, I remember hearing uh, one pastor at a time uh, talk about kind of idols that we may have personally, and he mentioned a guy who had a collection of arrowheads. Some of you may remember this story. And somebody went and, it was like his whole upstairs, his attic, his whole, just arrowheads, this huge collection. Some guy went up there, he went up, he's visiting me, and I've got all these arrowheads maybe, and I go up and I show him, because I'm proud of him, and I want him to see these things, and I just really impress the socks off of this guy, and he says, how much for him? And I, I'm like, uh, that's not for sale. No, how much? And I list this price. There's no way this guy's going to pay him. And he says, sold. And you're like, oh. And this is what, kind of what happens to Ephron. Like, it's not, I don't know that Ephron was totally unwilling, but he sets this price that's way too high. And Abraham buys the field for 400 shekels of silver. He weighs it out right there. He pays for it. This is amazing. And you think, where do you get the money? God provided it, the money. God made him wealthy. Who made him wealthy? God did, not the people of the land. Abram was real clear about that before to make careful that that couldn't be said. God gave him all this land. Ephron gets rich. 400 shekels of silver according to the way it's current among the merchants. He did it. He paid for it. You can imagine Ephron was probably like, oh, oh no. <laughs> I named the price, and it's way high, but he's paying it, and okay. And this, so let's look at verse 17. So the field of Ephron and Machpelah, which was to the east of Mamre, the field with the cave that was in it, and all the trees that were in the field. I'm not sure why that's mentioned. That's, and all the trees that were in the field. Maybe the trails, trees were used other than for firewood for some cultural purpose or something. Maybe in their burial plots or things like that. Who knows? I don't know. But maybe some scholar knows, and I just haven't found the answer yet. But. All the trees, trees that were in the field throughout its whole area was made over to Abraham as a possession in the presence of the Hittites before all who went in at the gate of his city. That's a very legal way of talking about it back in the time. This was official, right? It had the notary seal on it, right? Logged into the, to the county courthouse. This was done. It's his. He's got the deed. What a thing. He's got it. Consider, this tells us a lot about Abraham. I mean, first of all, he's, God, let's first say this, God did give him a possession in the, in the land. Like we don't read anywhere in here about, it doesn't remind us, and God promised him that, he, that his descendants would possess the land, and he began to possess it. But we know that. This was the first possession of Abraham or his descendants in the land was a burying, burial ground. That's, in a way, it's encouraging, it's kind of discouraging. The only place we've got is a place to bury our dead. Like, how much land do you own? Well, we own a cemetery. Well, what about a farmland? Nah, just a cemetery. That was the deal. When we bought it, we could use it as a burial place, and that's how it's used. This is a burial place. And that's all they've got. But they've got it. And a new ancestral home in the land that will be theirs. But you see about Abraham's, Abraham's character, this is, he doesn't begrudge this. He doesn't try to negotiate. Why? Because the most important thing for him was to establish something here. And God had given him all that wealth. I mean, this was God's way of providing it for him. We might be tempted. This was you. You might be tempted to look, come to the situation and say, God, you need to, this is a ridiculous price. This guy is not being fair. You need to work something out where this guy comes down on his price, or maybe he does just give it to me as a gift totally. But this is, I can't, this is too much. This is not a fair market price. I'm not doing that. Rather, than Abraham looks at it and says, well, God gave me all this. Here you go. And that's what the price is. Take it. And you could imagine him telling Isaac, look, God provided for us a place to bury Sarah, your mother. The goodness of God to give us this land. Right? God used these means. God had been providing for him all this time, and he had the means to possess it. God did that. So you see, you see that. 
What else? Let's keep reading then. Verses 19 and 20. After this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field at Machpelah, east of Mamre, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. The field and the cave that is in it were made over to Abraham as property for a burying place by the Hittites. So it's final. And you see here how settled Abraham is in finding, in, in moving his family away from thinking about Haran as home or Babylon or Ur of the Chaldeans as home, and instead home is where God promised us we would have a possession. That's where home is. And he, he, does, he, he acts in this way. He pays an exorbitant price to, to ensure it. It's official. It's done. Then in the next chapter, we begin, and I'm not going to go into all this, but we begin, and what does he do? He's, it's kind of at odds. He, he wants to move his family in this direction, but for his, for his son, for a bride, he's not willing to have him marry people in this area. Why? Because he's seen there's no fear of God there. He's seen that they worship these false gods. He knows what their character's like. And it's not that his family in, an every, in every sense is so much better, but there's, there's a difference. They know something about this call that he had. That's why they left Ur of the Chaldeans to begin with, to get on this way. And so he sends over there. And they respond favorably even. They hear about what God has done and they say, go. Who are we to stand in God's way? If God is doing all these things for Abraham. So, you see Abraham seeking to make a good beginning for Isaac and for those that would follow. All right, now, just by way of application and to close, I want us to look at Hebrews chapter 11 and just a couple verses here, a few verses, to think about Abraham and about Sarah, particularly Abraham in this text, but Sarah is mentioned as well. Hebrews 11, verse 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For why would he live that way? For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. So the reason he was content not to always wrangle and war and fight for property was because he was looking for something else. It says he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. He was, he was saying, look, I'm not worried about now. My hope is in preparing for what God has promised and making ready for that. You see that? He wasn't concerned about establishing anything in his time, but in preparing for when God would make good on his promises. Verse 11, by faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven, and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth, that while in this life they were strangers and exiles, they weren't really in the possession of what God had promised them. They weren't home enjoying what they were looking forward to, what they were longing for. Verse 14, For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. People who speak thus, people who describe themselves as foreigners and sojourners and exiles, they're not looking to have a home where you are. That was Abraham in this text, right? I'm a foreigner and a sojourner among you, but I want, I want a possession as a burying place, as a burial place. 
And because he spoke that way, their initial thought probably wasn't even that he really was serious about buying it. They said, you can have it for free. You can use it. Because he spoke as one who was not seeking a home among them. But when you speak that way, what it says, for people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. Verse 15, if they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, what we would typically think of as their homeland, they would have had opportunity to return. And we see two times when Abraham had reason to go back, just in these, in the end of 22 through 23, two big reasons Abraham had to go back. But they didn't. But as it is, they desire a better country. That is, a heavenly one. You see? Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He has prepared for them a city. This is a wonderful text. You're seeing here, I think partly commentary on Abraham's whole life, but even these instances of his life, where he had reasons to go back to a homeland. But he didn't, because he wasn't seeking to be comfortable there. And to go back to his home, he didn't feel like he had roots there. What was out in store for him, the future of his family and of, him, of himself and all that the blessing God had promised him was here. It wasn't back there. And it wasn't even in obtaining a bunch of property here. He just wanted a burial place so that his descendants could come to the place where Abraham and Sarah were buried. He wasn't seeking a farm or a city. He was seeking some, a different kind of city, a heavenly one. He was looking to the promises of God and all this blessing that God had promised would come. He was seeking to position his, himself and his family in the best way possible, the, the way most suitable to bring this thing about that God had promised. And that was really it. I think it's wonderfully helpful. So what do I want to say, just in conclusion? I said we're turning to Hebrews 11 for application, and we are. God's promises in Abraham's life were not exhausted in his lifetime. God promised him, I'll do all these things, and, what, and God did all those things. But in Abraham's lifetime, he saw just a few of them. From what he saw, he knew that the rest were, were, were certain to come to pass, but they hadn't come to pass yet. He didn't get to enjoy all these things. He didn't get to see them the same way you or I might see them. And this is the same way for us. Like we have seen a lot more or we have lived after a lot more of the things God promised Abraham he would do. We've seen a lot of those things happen historically. But even for us, the majority of what God has promised us is yet out in the future. Right? I mean, you're going to live and if the Lord doesn't return first, you're going to live and die with most of the things, most of the good things God has promised you. You're not going to experience them. You are going to live your life under the careful watch watch care of God under His shepherding and His guidance and His instruction and His tender mercy. You're going to see in your life one instance after another of God's faithful promises coming to pass. You have every reason to believe His character and to trust Him for what's, what He hasn't done yet. But most of what He's promised you're not going to experience. You just won't. None of us will. It's, it's, most of what we're going to experience is yet to even be imagined. I mean, this is wonderful. But see Abraham here. He's acting, he's preparing, even in this, this burial where it's very inconvenient, maybe the most convenient thing would be to hold on to his money and just borrow the tomb. But he's acting as a man who's fully convinced that God is going to do what God said he would do. So he acts radically different. He's paying prices. He's got no business paying prices for this land. But he does it gladly because he's convinced that God's going to fulfill his promise. God swore him an oath. This is certain and sure. And I say, well, isn't he worried about giving, all that, much, all that mo giving up all that money? What's he going to do? God's going to continue to provide. He has so far. God promised me he'd do these things for me, and he will. It's just another example where you see, it's not surprising to see Abraham acting the way he acts in chapter 23. Once you see the test he passed in 22, I mean, I'm not surprised he's acting this way. It's wonderfully encouraging that he is. But it's, he's still acting that way in faith. He's not just, Genesis 23 is not just about a guy trying to negotiate with the locals for a piece of land. He's act, he has no reason to pursue this except the faith that he has that God will bring his descendants back there. 
And he has no reason to pay this exorbitant price except the fact that he knows God will continue providing for him. He can afford it because God will provide for him. Ephron didn't think he could afford it. He knew Abraham, but he set a price up there that's not likely to be paid. And he paid it anyway. For that little field and that little cave over there that no one's ever found a use for yet, it wasn't like they said, well, okay, but we're going to have to strip all our stuff down and move our city hall somewhere else like that. Nobody used that thing. He paid big time for it. To have it. Well, again, just this exhortation to remember God's promises are not exhausted in our lifetime. But like Abraham, we ought to be acting as those who are fully convinced that they will come to pass. And that changes how we act. Like it, Abraham negotiated differently than they ever expected him to because of that. You wonder what price Ephraim would have said if he knew. If he knew that he might, he'd pay any price to have that. I don't know. It would be hard to Ephron to save face if he raised the price too much more, that's for sure. Um, you could imagine him going home that day and people saying, you should, you got a heck of a price for that field. He said, this is, you know, and, uh, you know, some of them boasting about it and others saying, you shouldn't have treated Abraham that way. Like, he's a mighty <coughs> prince among us. Like, what are you doing? You could see kind of both happening, you know. Or Ephron saying, hey, I've set the market. He wants to go buy someone else's field. And they say, hey, I guess the going rate for a field of that price is 400 shekels of silver. He says, no, 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 no. That's not the price. That's just what Abraham paid. You know, it's, that wasn't what the, what the going rate for acreage was anymore. But um, it's an important text in that respect. We learn a lot about Abraham and his, and his thinking and, and what the life of faith looks like in this instance. It's a helpful text. Um, so I hope that uh, it's important to you now in some ways and, and uh, you see some lessons that you can learn from it. And um, it is back in your Bible again as one of those texts that is profitable for us, right? And uh, able to equip us. Well, let's pray and we'll make ready for our meal together. Heavenly Father, we, we do thank you. Um, we can look at a text like this, and it, when we see it at first, it kind of seems mundane and trivial. And uh, certainly didn't feel that way for Abraham. It shouldn't for us. Uh, we, we know when those who are dear to us pass, it is a sober and important time, and every detail is significant. And it was no less that way for Abraham. And uh, we thank you, though, for uh, giving us these examples where we see faith lived out in those details that otherwise seem trivial, in those matters that don't seem to be as important to us as we read through. And yet, uh, this is what you desire from us in our day-to-day, -day, in those little details of our own life. You want faithfulness and uprightness, integrity, mercy, justice. So we pray you'd help us in this to be thoroughly Christian in all that we do. To not uh, think of our, our faith in you as reserved for the big moments, but as something that is uh, with us all the time and affects every decision we make. So in that regard, thank you for Abraham as this example, as a man who was not seeking an opportunity to go back, but was looking <coughs> forward, full of faith in the promises of God. Thank you for this text and for what's here and for your son who's secured for us all that has been promised. In his name we pray. Amen.